What's going on, No Nation? It's CJ Wilson here with another episode of Dope Talk. I am your host. We have a special edition of Behind Enemy Lines for this week, as we have the Clemson Tigers will be coming to Tallahassee for the much-anticipated, probably the biggest showdown in the ACC on an annual basis. I have William Quackenbush with me, sports radio personality for 105.5 The Roar, the flagship station for Clemson for the Clemson Tigers. Will, how's it going, man? It's real good to hear from you. CJ, it's great to see you, man. I hope you're doing well. And uh, I know it's been it's been a rough few days up here. I know it's been a rough few days down there, too, with weather and everything else. So I'm excited to be talking ball uh, and not talking yeah. about whose power's on and how many trees are in your yard. Yeah, that's another thing, too. I hope you're well up there for sure. Um, it ended up coming through the Tallahassee area. And, and heck, like you said, the Carolinas were, were, were affected as well. Um, even my family members that's up in Clemson, uh, DeAndre McDaniel, he was um, out. I think powerful a little bit leading up to the game last week. Are you doing fine in just like the Asheville, North Carolina area, just to to see the the stuff they've been going through? It's really crazy. You got to you know take this type of stuff. Well, not don't take this type of stuff. Don't take don't take it for granted, rather, and appreciate you know what you really have. So first of all, how are you doing before we get started? Yeah, but we're doing well. I mean, we're very fortunate. Um, we're in a little bit of a newer neighborhood, so not a lot of trees and stuff that came down. Very minimal property damage. We were without power for like 52 hours, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, there were some people that were real lucky and it didn't lose it at all. There were a few people like that or, or you know, a couple hours. And there's lots of folks that still have damage. Um, there's people, you know, two streets down from us, um, kind of in a more wooded area that there's still a you know, a tree leaned against a power line today. Um, and there were, there were crews working on it when, uh, when I drove by there earlier. So it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a unique situation. I mean, you know, a lot of folks were, there was a, there was a discussion of, among the towns, uh, the, you know, townspeople here about whether they should have played last week or not. Um, I happen to think it was, it, it created some problems, uh, but it was a, ultimately a greater good that they played because it gave the businesses that did have power a chance to make some game day revenue and it gave people a distraction tens of thousands of people whether they were from here or whether they from out of town uh it gave them a chance to like have a hot meal with a generator and you know i understand people who didn't have a ticket or don't care about football were kind of ticked about that but um it was it was nice to be able to have a distraction for a little bit and you know selfishly i worked the game so i was I was happy to get a little extra income too, because I'm gonna have to replace a few things on my property, and that's that's a, you know, that's kind of a that's kind of a big deal too. So I, I get both sides, but the area is doing better, and um, like I said, we're we're just excited to not be talking as much about power and trees and damage, and talking more about football like we should be this time of year. Right, I hundred percent get the conversation both ways as far as that with um, us kind of being in that situation, not on the well, I guess you say pretty much on an annual basis with these storms that come through through during this time of year. So I 100% get that. But, yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's definitely good to actually, you know, have the ball to kind of get away a little bit from the reality in some, in some aspects. But before we get started, make sure you guys like this video and subscribe to the channel. Again, like this video and subscribe to the channel. It does us a world of favors as far as the adult uh, talk community. Just getting this stuff out to like-minded knows and also Clemson fans who want to hear similar information as well. All right, well, let's jump into it. So, 3-1 and one thus far. Oak started off on one, played a rough game against Georgia. Offense didn't really get things going. Then you have a few games after that, you know, App State. I mean, that I looked at the, the, the scoreboard for the App State game. I think it was like the first quarter or so. And even NC State, and I had to make sure I was looking at the same score. So, it seems like Clemson has gotten things back rolling. 3-1, and one, two annoying ACC play and a top 15 team and kind of getting things rolling at the right time. I'll just talk about the job Dabo has done this year, you know, since there's been a lot of conversation the last couple of years as far as Clemson not being the same Clemson. You know, it's it's a it's a really good coaching job that he's done. Um, I think his patience with Cade has paid off. Uh, that's that's something I think uh, a lot of folks, even after the spring game, I mean, we, we had full conversations on our show about whether uh, there was a backup that could take over. Trent Pierman was the best quarterback in the spring game. He's a – uh, preferred walk on that was a two time player of the year down the street. His dad's uh, on staff at Clemson, um, but he not a scholarship guy. And he was the best quarterback. I mean, you know, and, and the thing looked kind of tailor made for Cade to have success. And so people are going, man, you know, if he can't have success like that with all the right offensive line and receivers and all that, 
It, it may not work for him. And then you had the Georgia game that it looked better, but it still was not explosive. And he missed some throws and missed some plays. I mean, I go back to the, the first series of the Georgia game, and then I'll, I'll give you my big picture take of that and why Clemson was able to move past it. First series of the Georgia game, first play, uh, Cade bounces a pass that Phil Moffa catches for a 30-yard game. Uh, that's, that's not okay. That's totally on Cade. Everything worked great. I had people afterwards telling me, you know, this – Dabo's meddling in the offense. What's Garrett Riley? You know, this is not the Garrett Riley offense. I want to be like, what are you supposed to do as a play caller? The quarterback skips rocks to the, you know, intended receiver that's wide open. You scheme the play open. Why am I mad at the play caller for that? You can't be mad at that. So then second down, they get a couple yards. And third down, they ran another nice play. Jake Brainstool sits down between two linebackers. Kate hits him right in the numbers. He drops the ball. That's your three and out right there, first series. You don't get going. And uh, with more time... Uh, you know, in, in the game, it felt like Kirby Smart's defense just sort of constricted and constricted and constricted. The one thing that happened, though, that I thought was encouraging, and I said so at the time, was that Clemson didn't lose that game at the lines of scrimmage. Uh, I, I think if you had said before the year that Georgia beat Clemson 34-3, me, you, everybody would have said, well, they just can't hang at the lines of scrimmage. I mean, Georgia's just superior at the lines of scrimmage. And uh, they just overwhelmed Clemson eventually. That is not what happened. Uh, Clemson actually lost because of receivers and running backs and linebackers. That's what it was. It was, and I, I would even say not even quarterbacks. I thought Carson Beck was better than Kate Klubnick. But I tweeted this out after the game. If you look at air yards per attempt, uh, Kate Klubnick and Carson Beck was at roughly the same, like down to the hundredth of a, a percentage. Like uh, it was like 3.7 something and 3.8 something air yards per attempt. The difference in passing yards between Georgia and Clemson was yards after the catch. And that's where Clemson's receivers, especially the older guys, Cole Turner and Adam Randall, did not have good games. They couldn't fully unleash Antonio Williams. They didn't even target Tyler Brown until the third quarter. There were lots of things that, that Clemson could have done better. They probably should have run Phil Mothamore. Lots of issues, right? But the line of scrimmage was not the issue. And so you're going to the Appalachian State game going, okay, that is encouraging because Matt Luke's brand new. You've got the kind of the same pieces from last year with one notable exception, the center, Ryan Linthicum, who was a four-star, number one center in the country coming in, but had barely played in three years. Uh, this is like his time to shine as a redshirt junior, but there's a reason he hasn't been out there. Well, he's been flawless. I mean, you hadn't noticed that at all through four games. And what they ended up doing against Appalachian State is they took advantage of a lack of speed they went over the top. They hit their plays early. They played the freshmen, Wesco and Moore, at receiver. And ultimately, I, I was told that was a directive from Dabo Sweeney, that he was basically like, we're playing these freshmen. Uh, we're not doing this with these older guys again. And uh, ultimately, that led to the older guys playing better. That led to Adam Randall being a legitimate loss. He broke his foot, and you know he's probably going to be out a couple weeks. I doubt he plays against you guys, but we haven't been told that. Um, so but we shall see on that, but the, the infusion of young players at receiver, Phil Maffa being a workhorse, um, and the offensive line keeping Kate upright. I think he, uh, I think he's been sacked three times in four games, twice against Georgia, and I believe one time last week is all. He's had clean pockets, and so I give you know all that to say, I give Dabo a lot of credit for not bailing on Cade because all the stuff around him was poor. You made a change at offensive line coach. Thomas Austin's a personal friend of mine. I like him a lot, but Matt Luke was an upgrade. He's one of the best offensive line coaches in the country, and he's done a remarkable job with that unit. It is night and day better than it was last year. They're able to run the type of run scheme that Garrett Riley wants to run. They're able, obviously, for to give Kate a clean pocket and give him time to throw. The backs are better at pass pro. The receivers are blocking better. It's like everything is just better, a little bit better right now in year two of Garrett Riley's system. And then the defense, like you said, you know, the defense held up for a while against Georgia. Um, they hadn't had Peter Woods the last couple games, and they hadn't been able to stop the run. And to me, if I'm Florida State, that's the one thing that I'm honestly hoping happens, is that Peter Woods still not 100% coming off the knee. He took a cheap <laughs> shot. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, he took a cheap shot against and Appalachian crazy State. Because Peter and, Woods is probably, and, and you spoke about the line of scrimmage for Clemson and Georgia. Peter Woods is probably the best defensive lineman in that game. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, they they could they couldn't block Peter Wood. You, you can't block a three hundred twenty pound defensive end, right? I mean, nobody's going to do that. No tackle is is equipped to do that when a when a guy's got a head start. You just can't. So what you do is you kind of like option him. 
you run across his face, which they did with Smith, and they did it with Bell, and uh, you chip him with Delp and those tight ends, and you don't try to run at him, and you don't try to block him. You try to option him, and it worked mm -hmm. about 50% of the time, but then the rest of the time, Peter Wood's able to, to kind of eat a little bit. So they've done a pretty good job adjusting to that. I would say this has been one of the better coaching jobs, mostly because Dabo Sweeney didn't change a lot of stuff. He kept a lot of the same things, made some tweaks, made a big hire offensively, and now this offense is a lot more explosive. All right, so yeah, you, you pretty much covered it. a lot of things I was going to ask, Ashley. So I, guess we're just <laughs> I know, man. I'm, I'm undisciplined. My apologies. I'm very yeah, undisciplined. I like, I like it. I like it a lot. So just speak about Cade and just the – and we. I guess you kind of said just being patient with him, with Dabo being patient with him. And we want to rush these quarterbacks all the time, right? You want – First or second year, got first. Well, really, your second year, people expect you to be light out, but sometimes it just doesn't work like that. But to speak about Cade and him being comfortable in in Riley's offense in year two. Yeah, I think we overestimated the sort of uh, add water element of Cade with Garrett Riley because Max Duggan was great uh, with Garrett Riley. Max Duggan was also a fifth year player, and so he had already developed physically, and he, you know, he's learned offense, and he sort of knows how to play the quarterback position. And so we sort of were like, okay, well, Cade's the new Max Duggan. Here we go. And it turned out that Cade still had some development to, to go outside of just Garrett Riley being his quarterback coach. He still had some maturation. He still had to see some things and experience some things and fail in some things. And they weren't very good around him. Um, the same stuff that you guys are saying about DJ right now um, and the same things you might be saying about Brock Glenn at the end of this game, I'm not sure – are exactly what Dabo Sweeney has been saying for three years. we got to be better around our quarterbacks. Yes, the quarterback play has been subpar, but we have not been very good around and we're not helping our quarterbacks. And so this receiver group, running backs, offensive line, play caller, everybody's helping Cade, and Cade is helping himself. Uh, there was a play in the, uh, in the Sanford game where Cade uh, gets flushed out of the pocket one of the few times that protection broke down a little bit, it was four-man rush. And it's, it's like two man down the field. So a lot of the DBs have their backs turned. And he pulls the ball down instead of, you know, hesitating, you know, getting sort of like seeing ghosts out there. He pulls the ball down calmly, starts directing traffic up the field, directing blockers, and he ends up running a touchdown. It's the first offensive series. Kate's not calm enough to make that play last year. He's going to do something drastic. He's going to do something frenetic. He's either going to take a sack. He's going to throw the ball away. He's going to throw a pick. He's going to be reckless. He was calm. He pulls the ball down, makes a play with his legs. To me, that's the difference in Kate is that he's he's gone from like being a beagle puppy to like a, you know, a golden retriever or something like a like a grown dog, you know. And I think that's the biggest part of his development. He's just comfortable. He trusts everybody. He's more of a na I think he was forcing leadership last year, but he's more of a natural leader by example with his words this year. I think all of that is combined to make him a, a dangerous player. Let's transition to the, uh, I guess, the running back room. And you tell me you lose a, a five-star running back that was, was was so productive. He replaced him with another running back. I wouldn't have thought that the running back room or that what a running back room or that running back particular would be better. But, hell, you got Phil Moffa, who was a, a low with that running back, real explosive, a big time back, in my opinion. Even last year against Florida State, he had some really explosive runs. Let's talk about Phil Moffa and him and being the main guy within the Clemson running back room for the 2024 season. Well, it's a great point uh, that you lost Will Shipley, and Shipley, I mean, he's playing for the Philadelphia Eagles right now. He's, he's a good back, really good leader, um, guy a lot of people respected from the moment he stepped on campus. Now, I fought people at the beginning of last year who said that Phil Moffa was a better back because I said, nah, like, Will Shipley's more valuable in other things, like running the football between right. the tackles. Yeah, Phil Moffa's a little better, but, like, Will Shipley gives you some other stuff. And an example of that, I actually asked Phil about this this week, and I've asked him about it before. He missed the block on the fumble six where Cade took the shot last year against Florida State. It was his block. Um, pass protection was a real weakness for him, but it wasn't for, uh, for Will Shipley. And so coming into the year, those were questions. Those questions have been answered. Phil Moff is tough as nails. Uh, he's been banged up a little bit this year, but it hasn't affected his play at all. And uh, he really hasn't even needed to carry it a bunch of times, but we know he can. I mean, last year, I think it was a Notre Dame or North Carolina, one of those games he carried it over 30 times in a game when Will Shipley was out. And that's huge. That's hard to do. And at 230 pounds, he's equipped to do it. 
Uh, he also broke off, he's broken off a couple of big long runs, like 40, 50 plus yard runs already this year. And he's shown some breakaway speed, man. Phil Moff is a real deal. And uh, he's a true workhorse back. Clemson hasn't had a workhorse back since late stage Travis Etienne. I think Moffa reminds me, of, it's kind of a mixture in some ways between Etienne and Wayne Gallman, who is the, the previous oh, workhorse back. Yeah. But he's a little bit stronger between the tackles. But he also has some wiggle to him. He's a good stop and start guy. Maybe not quite as good catching the ball out of the backfield as ETM was. But in terms of playmaking ability, uh, I'd have to put him above Gallman. But uh, in terms of run between the tackles and through contact and stuff like that, uh, he's, he's a little bit bigger than ETM. So I got to say, you know, a blend of those two guys. All right, let's talk about the offensive line. You mentioned the switch and offensive line coaching. Do you think it was a philosophy thing just related to the players? What do you think was the light bulb in regards to the offensive line switch that's relaying so good with, the, with, with this 2024 version of the Clemson offensive line? You know, it's funny, Davos, when he was asked about that, I believe it was last week or two weeks ago, and he basically, before he got to Matt Luke, he said this group is older and more experienced. You got four starters returning on this offensive line. You have Tristan Lee, who last year was a first-time starter. You have Marcus Tate, who was hurt some of last year and was a uh, – his first start was in the Georgia game, but he's kind of had a trial by fire. He was like the elder statesman in the room last year. You have Walker Parks, who – Thought he may never play football again. Had a debilitating injury. Really didn't play that uh, last year. He is back at right guard and could be back next year for a sixth year, which is remarkable. And then you have Blake Miller, who was a sophomore last year, now going into his junior season. These guys have played a lot of football. And then you add, you know, you've got Colin Sadler, who's not a freshman. Um, you know, you've got a couple of guys that have come along. Elijah Thurman's a good, a good true freshman this year that's versatile, that's like one of those ready-made guys that can contribute. Um, you know, you, you, you've got a few Harris Sewell in the interior. Uh, is no longer a friend. I think Sadler's maybe a third year player, but Sewell second year guy. So ultimately I think it is, it is an experience thing where you've got more guys with experience that you can count on on the offensive line, man. Uh, Ryan Linthicum told us that Matt Luke talks about instead of being five pennies, you need to be one nickel as the offensive line. I love that. One of the things that he's done is he has created a collective sense of pride in that group. And I know people shared that clip of, you know, the, the, the linemen pulling into each other in the Georgia game. People, you know, that went around social media and rightfully so. I mean, that was a hilarious clip and a terrible, uh, terrible misstep out of a timeout, I might add. That was the only play that Clemson ran the entire first half in Georgia's side of the field, by the way, because they went backwards that play and then never crossed the 50 again until after the second half. So that like that was it should have been it should have been uh, should have been shared. But one of the things that came out of that game is this offensive line. They're pulling better. The, the GT counter stuff is working. Uh, the HT stuff is working. Um, any kind of stretch, any kind of pulling anything, they're able to do with more conviction and confidence. And so you're able to run more of the Garrett Riley stuff. What happened at the end of last season is they had to trash a lot of the counter stuff, the misdirection, and the GT pull. Uh, Clemson couldn't run it. They, they weren't athletic enough. They weren't convicted enough. They did, you could tell they weren't quite sure about how to do it. This year, they're able to, to do the entire Garrett Riley run game, and it's really helped Garrett Riley get in his bag a little bit more. It's helped Cade win in the RPO game and be able to set some things up. Um, the offensive line, that, that like they do have a lot of starts. They have a lot of experience. Even the new guys are older, but it's also that collective sense of pride that Matt Luke brought to the table as one of the best offensive line coaches in the country who just happened to be out of work. I really like that analogy, Be going to be five nickels or excuse me one nickel instead of five pennies that's really good and also i wish fsu would stop using gt counter for sure because god damn it hasn't been impressive at all to the pass catchers man and and like we stated earlier these guys are kind of looking like the clemson oh uh, we got the the young young freshman one very excited for kind of push the older guys you know dad was a receiver coach by trade just talk about the upgrade of that room i guess it starts with the competition, right? With the younger guys pushing the older guys and getting more results all around. Yeah, it really does. I mean, that infusion of talent is big no matter where it comes from. You guys saw it. Uh, you, Johnny Wilson one year, Keon Coleman the next year. You, you get that infusion of talent. You get those game breakers. And all of a sudden, guess what? Your, your other guys look really good. Now, I mean, you guys are seeing this year when you don't have those differential talents, those erasers, those like 50-50 ball guys, those – 
the, the, the guys that are always a yes for the quarterback, uh, your, your pass game doesn't look nearly as good. And so your quarterback's more hesitant. Like, there's a lot of chicken and egg stuff with that. Clemson dealt with that for, like, three years. And, you know, like, Bo Collins transferred to Notre Dame. I like Bo personally. I think he's a good dude. I didn't see a lot of conviction in him as a receiver. Um, you know, I, I remember a couple years ago they were jacked up because Dakari Collins blocked a guy through the back of the end zone against Wake Forest. The, the receivers were soft. Not only did they not catch the ball, they didn't block. They were, they were nothing. They were a zero on the perimeter. Now you're seeing with these two freshmen coming in, like it was like when Bryant Wesco caught that pass against Appalachian State, all the older guys were like, oh, okay, it's game on now. And so Adam Randall's played better. Cole Turner's played better. Troy Salato's been healthy. He's been better. I mean, this, this group is unbelievable right now. Antonio Williams is back. He redshirted last year, missed all the four games. And we've barely seen Tyler Brown. I mean, I thought Tyler Brown was your leading receiver last year as a freshman. He was a, you know, a, a former Minnesota commit who was right the road at Greenville High School. And I watched him play high school thinking, Minnesota's got him a steal, man. They, 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 uh, boy, they stole him right out from everybody's nose. And it turns out he ends up at Clemson as a really good player. He's just not been healthy. And uh, he got hurt, like, early in the App State game, barely played last week. I'm, I'm hoping that he's able to go fully against, uh, against Florida State this weekend. So I would say they haven't even really been uh, fully funded. Like I say, Randall may not play. In the last couple of years, if you got a couple of receivers out, like starters or second-string guys, you're going, oh, man, like which coach's kid's going to start out there? Like which – which guy can't play? Are we going to have to like cross our fingers and cross our toes that he can make plays? But this group is so much more competent and comfortable. I think Kate is throwing catchable balls now. And I think some of it is that a fire has been lit, not by coaches. Because look, man, I mean, you know this, CJ, like coaches can only do so much, right? Like you can, it, next man up sounds great, but if there is no next man, the players know. And so you can play next man up all day long, but if the players know that guy can't play at all, there's no real competition there. There's an actual competition for snaps now because you brought in dudes that out the box can ball. Wesco can fly. He's the fastest guy on the field. Cole Turner's the fastest receiver, I think. But like on the field against DBs, Brian Wesco's the fastest guy. TJ Moore's as physical on the ball in the air as anybody Clemson has right now. Those two dudes, if you're not playing, if you're not blocking downfield, if you're not earning snaps, they are taking them. And that, I think, has lit a fire under everybody. It's ignited the fan base. It's ignited the passing game. And so I, I do credit those young guys, but also the older guys got the hint, and now they're playing better. And so that whole room has just been dramatically different the last three games. That's beautiful to hear because you recruit, you recruit players to replace the current players that's on your roster, and it's up for the guys on the roster to fend those, current, those new recruits away. So we have a perfect blend – of a team that actually understands that concept and, and takes it in a good way, you have good results, and you guys are seeing the results of that. Let's move over to the defense, which has been the Clemson's bread and butter, butter for a long time. Let's talk about that front seven. We spoke about Peter Woods. Let's talk about the linebackers and Carter. And, of course, you guys have um, Wade with us as well. Let's talk about that front seven and how great they've been playing thus far within the season. Real physical bunch. You know what's funny is, like, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. To me, um, I, I thought the defensive line would be better. Uh, in fact, I thought the defensive tackles would be a little better, which is why they were able to slide Peter Woods out to defensive end. That's another coaching change that Dabo made. I thought the defensive ends, I mean, you had Miles Murphy going first round in the NFL. Man, I, I'm sorry. I, like, I appreciate draftability and prospect status and all that stuff. And he was a fairly productive player. I didn't see it. I've seen Cleveland Farrell, like I, the late games Adams. Like I watched him play 20 years ago. Miles Murphy, five-star, great player. He did not make the impact that those guys made, in my opinion. Um, and so he, like, he didn't develop as a player when he got here the way that those guys did. And so you're looking for a little better development. Um, TJ Parker comes in as a freshman, makes an immediate impact. And when Peter Woods is out, you don't really have to – do anything up front except double team TJ Parker, you can kind of slough off that other defensive end. They've kind of rotated three guys in there. Uh, okay, Denoff, um, Jaheim Lawson, Shaq Lawson's younger brother, and AJ Hoffler. And I would say, again, mixed back for those guys. If Woods is back, that's a formidable bunch up front. Demonte Capehart has been pretty good. Trey Williams has been incredible. 
Uh, I've been really, really impressed with him. Um, so you've got some guys in that defensive tackle rotation that have been awfully uh, that have been awfully good, but none of them have played a ton of snaps. And um, I think Capehart still has some more in the tank. I mean, it, you know, there were poachers out trying to get him into the NFL. He had some conversations, and uh, folks from other schools were trying to get him in the offseason, and he stayed. And uh, we've yet to really see that on the linebacker side. I, Clemson has three really good linebackers they have two like full-grown gazelles and a baby deer uh you've got that, that, Barry that Carter. Is very good. oh yeah no no doubt we gonna get to that Barry Carter's real good he, he did not have a good first couple games but he had 10 tackles on Saturday he's looked more comfortable he was a slow starter last year so that might be just kind of how he's wired a little bit um but man he was flying around Saturday really nice Wade Wood as holy lord man that guy's possessed he forced a fumble on a fourth down on Stamper's first possession. The running back, actually, he made the line to gain, but Wood has punched the ball out, and another back fell on the ball on the wrong side of the, the line to gain. And so that ended up being a turnover on downs because Wood has, is able to, even though they didn't recover the fumble, he's able to punch it backwards behind that line and then made an interception. Like, that guy levitated for an interception, man. It was unbelievable. I think he's highly underrated. He's another one of those like three-star guys that Dabo finds and Brent Venables found him all the time that just have athleticism for days and instincts and can play. And then Sammy freaking Brown, man, that guy is possessed. He's second on the team in tackles as a backup linebacker. He was a five-star kid out of Georgia, Jefferson High School. Uh, he played linebacker, running back, and punter in high school. Um, and he just knows how to play. He doesn't know any of the plays right now. He's out of position a lot. Like, he's just kind of, again, he's, he's kind of a baby deer out there. But, man, he is a thumper. And um, they've actually they've had some injuries in that linebacker group, too. So they're they're pretty thin right now behind those three guys. Kobe McLeod was the next man up. Ray Ray McLeod's younger brother, Jordan McLeod's brother, that's, um, that's been a quarterback, James Madison. And I think he's at Texas State now, if I remember right. Um, he was a backup. He got hurt and is out for the year. So it's, it's a little bit of a thinner group, but, uh, man, they, they made some adjustments second half. Stanford took it to them. They rushed for over 150 yards in the first half. Stanford did. It was quarterback and running back run game, and uh, they put the kibosh on that in the second half uh, because a lot of those first-string guys and then some of the second-string guys decided they were tired of getting their brains beat in by Stanford's front. Yeah, Brown. Brown is a playmaker for sure, man. I'm, it seems like Clemson just always gets those type of – like, so you had the three-star linebackers that you can kind of find from good scouting, and then Clemson typically has that big-time recruit on defense that comes along as well, and Brown seems to fit that bill. Speak about the secondary, you have uh, K, R, excuse me, R.J. Mickens and Avion Terrell, A.J. Junger brothers. Speak about the secondary and what those guys bring to the table. Yeah, Mickens has been really good. I mean, he's, he's old. Uh, he was talking to media this week. He said, man, there's – stuff that like the younger players say now that I have no idea what they're talking about. He's like, that's how long I've been here. Um, and he, he's one of those guys, like he's a good playmaker, but I think of him as like one of those safeties that knows where to be. You know, he's just always around the football. He's not going to bust. He's not going to make a lot of mistakes. He's a sure tackler. He made the first tackle in the Stanford game on a horizontal play. And I mean, he busted up a ball carrier and kind of just sent the message that you're not going to, you're not going to play outside the hash marks today. And I really think that's in part what – I think Stanford knew that, but I think that's in part why Stanford kept the ball on the ground because R.J. Mickens kind of set that tone. Khalil Barnes has been really good in that way. Um, he's been impactful, uses a nickel, uses a corner at times, used as a safety. Um, and in that corner, you know, Avion Terrell is really good. Like he, he is I, – I, I hesitate to say this because I know how it sounds – but he is a he's a better player than his brother was at this stage of development. He's a better cornerback. I think he might be a better athlete. I don't think he's quite as long. Like I hadn't measured their arms or anything, but he, he doesn't seem like quite that same body type as AJ was. But he's a better cover guy than AJ at this stage. AJ really made a jump, a little more like Nate Wiggins. Like it was midway through his sophomore year, boy, he really took that jump. And in the second half of that three-year career, sky's the limit for him. Avion came in out the box ready to play last year, and he got some opportunities and he did it. Uh, and one of the things that helps him is that Jaden Lucas is healthy. It's a kid from up the road at Malvin High School that was an athlete, big-time player, top 100 kid that was hurt all last year, has had shoulder issues. 
He was very good in the Georgia game, I thought. He got victimized one time on a touchdown pass. He's been really good. Shelton Lewis has been good in the slot. Ashton Hampton, who grew up in Tallahassee. I think Florida State recruited him hard. He's been good as a freshman uh, in that secondary. And then, you know, you've got backup safeties that have that have played really well. I think safety and defensive tackle are, are the two positions where Clemson actually has considerable depth on that defense. And uh, it helps when you can be right up the middle, defensive tackle, interior linebacker play, and the safeties when they're one hash or the other, that you can really focus your attention on that tunnel and you can leave those corners on islands a little bit. And uh, I think it's made Wes Goodwin's job a little bit easier this year. Look, this defense, they've given up some big plays. They're not statistically great. A lot of that is backups and third string guys playing against other team starters. NC State scored like four touchdowns after it was 52 to seven. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, Stanford got a late score like that. Uh, App State got a late score like that. So I, I don't think there's as much depth across the board as maybe if you're thinking about a 2017, 18, 19 Clemson defense. But it's it's a very good defensive group, especially that starting 11. Yeah, I don't think it's far-fetched either to say that Avion is is better at this point than AJ. Uh, both of those guys from West Lake High School. I was actually kind of hired on Avion myself coming out when he was a, a recruit. So I agree with you 100% as far as that not being far-fetched at this time. I will give me some of your do's and don'ts for the Clemson Tigers going into this game. Then we'll get your score prediction. I think you've got to stop Florida State from running the football. Uh, Now, you would argue, I think, that Florida State stops itself. Um, But I would say, you know, like I've watched Florida State this year, and I've been puzzled about, like, where is Lawrence Toafili? Like, where where is the explosive plays in the run game? I'm not asking for, like, five yards a clip. I'm just saying I think there are athletes in the backfield that can give you some explosive runs. Clemson's given up explosive plays on the ground. They, and, and last week, they gave up some sustained drives on the ground. In fact, the, the reason that they weren't in like a tie game or even behind at halftime is because they had two interceptions in the red zone. Stanford ended up one for four scoring in the red zone last week. Uh, mm. You know, Florida State may or may not do that, but, I, I you know, I don't like your odds if you're consistently – Having to you know stiffen your neck in the in the red zone, you know you've got to you've got to do a better job between the twenties and that. And so I think you, you can't let Florida State attack on the ground, especially given that Brock Glenn is going to play quarterback. He was zero for four last week. He was like forty percent his action last year. Make him throw the football. Make him beat you. That's the number one thing that you have to do for Clemson offensively. I think you've got to stay inside yourself. I keep waiting on Clemson to sort of sort of, uh, you know, get too full of itself, start taking chances that aren't there, start seeing things that aren't there, start thinking they can do whatever and wave a magic wand and make big plays happen. And they've been pretty disciplined, but that's also three games at home. And it's not Florida State, and there's not the extra spice of the rivalry and being in an opponent's stadium, which they haven't done this year. I think they've got to rely on Phil Moffa on the ground. I think they got to take big plays when they're there, but not force it. I think, uh, you know, I think, I think Florida State's corners are quite good. So if you've got guys in one-on-ones with, like, Cypress, for example, like, I, I mean, you could try it a couple times, but don't think they're just going to eat like the guys at Stanford, NC State, App State. You know, that, like, that's, that's a, a little bit of a different deal, especially for your younger receivers. So continue to trust that offense and trust that process and don't push too hard because I do think the defense is going to have a bounce-back game in this one. All right, Will, give me a score prediction. Oh, man, this is always tough. I, I, I keep thinking that there's something I'm missing with Florida State um, because, like, I'm looking at this team and I'm, like, if you start playing a win game, you're looking at, like, a two- or three-win team with what's coming up. Yeah. Like, who is going to be, you know, like, DJ has not been very good. There's been, like, one drive a half in every game where you're like, wow, that's why DJ's a five-star. That's amazing. Look at this offense. And the rest of the time, it's awful. I mean, it's like, get, right. you know, gouge your eyes out, hide your kids, hide your wife stuff. Um, but, you know, I, like I keep waiting for some better version of the offensive line to emerge, some better version of the run game to emerge. I, honestly, I'm not sure that this is the game that that's going to happen. I think the home crowd could turn on Florida State in this game. Uh, if Clemson scores a couple times, like I just, uh, you know, Florida and Florida State right now, it's dangerous to play home games. You'd almost rather go on the road where it's not yeah. as negative, especially for the offense. Um, yeah. I, 
And I, I, I do think Florida State's defense has shown some stuff. Like, I think they, they showed themselves worthy against Memphis. They showed themselves worthy uh, against Cal. And I think both those offenses are fine. Uh, but Clemson's going to hit a few big plays. I'm going to say uh, 38-13. I think Clemson wins there. And I just think it's going to be more of a, a little bit like the SMU game last week where it's close for a little bit. Florida State has a couple chances. But ultimately, they just can't convert enough chances offensively, can't get out of their own way. And Clemson's able to pull away in the in the third and fourth quarters. Yeah, I got it. 35 to 17, Clemson. <clears throat> and 17 maybe a stretch for Florida State. Like you just said, it's just certain situations where we just can't really get out of our own way. I want to see more of Lawrence Tour Philly in certain situations where I feel like he should get no less than 15 touches a game, in my opinion, at the very minimum, run and passing, just from the dynamic stuff he can do on the field. But we will see. I do. I agree with everything you said 100%. I don't think this is the game that it happens. Um, and like I said, Brock, is, this is Brock's third start, and you're going to this situation. It's funny that you mentioned the home crowd because – it was some points in Cal game where some bulls were raining in for DJ, uh, but I will say the home crowd did kind of muster a lot in that win as well. You know, Cal had some false starts in the red zone, a couple penalties. Dope was dope at that point in time, but now you're one and four. You get behind a couple scores against Clemson, it could turn real ugly really quick in Dope Camel Stadium. So give me 35 to 17 um, Clemson Tigers. They, they get things rolling and continue to dominate the ACC. Uh, Will, I appreciate you joining me. Let the people know what it is. Yeah, man, you can find me on 105.5 The Roar, flagship station at Clemson, Ackball Talk on Twitter. And, uh, man, if you're a glutton for punishment, I also do the halftime show and the postgame show on our on our uh, flagship station. So if you want a Clemson perspective on that, you may not want to. Uh, but, I, I, you know, if, you, if you're a glutton for punishment, I'll be there. <laughs> this is William Parker, who's one of the best in the business when it comes to Clemson football, uh, Clemson athletics in general. Uh, before we go, make sure you guys, again, like this video, subscribe to the channel. And if you are, um, if you do so happen to come to Dope Camel Stadium in Tallahassee for the Clemson game, make sure you guys grab a tailgate ticket. We're going to be hanging out um, for this Clemson game. Of course, it's always a big game in Tallahassee, so the uh, vibes will be festive. We do have a big tailgate going, um, $40. You can eat all you can eat, drink all you can drink, beer, liquor, uh, juices, water as well along with a really good menu. So if you guys are coming to the game, make sure you grab a tailgate ticket. Again, I'm CJ Wilson with Dope Talk. Appreciate you guys for joining.